turned the program around through really, uh, through a lot of work. We found out really quick, you know, when you want to succeed, nothing comes very easy. You really have to work at it. And, and uh, you know, and I, I suspect a little bit that that is the same thing that happens with you people. You know, things just don't fall your way all the time. You know, you, you just got to keep working and you, you have to, you have to believe. I probably had the opportunity to coach about 3,500 young men. And, and uh, uh, so I've, I've heard about every story. I've heard about every problem. I've heard about a lot of good things. But attitude is everything. That's what it says. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, than what other people think or say or do. It's more than appearing giftedness or skills. It will make or break a company, a church, or home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding our attitude. We will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the strengths that we have, and that is attitude. This is the one that I know as I went through all my problems, this is the one I, I, I thought was very important. I am convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And boy, if that isn't the truth. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. But it is just that. It is the fact of, of, of how we react to things that happen. And if we feel if we feel if we feel bad about it, if we feel insecure about it, then you know what? We're not we're going to have a hard time in what we're going to do. So that it to me is the most one of the most important things. And I had a young man uh, that I recruited from uh, Miramar High School in Fort Lauderdale, right outside of Fort Lauderdale. There, he was a uh, he, he was a, a young man that the a coach called me on him and said, hey, you come down and meet Demaya Wimberley. So I flew down to meet Demaya Wimberley. And, and uh, he was a uh, short, about five foot nine quarterback. And a black guy, threw left handed, so he had everything against him. Okay? You know, short, of course I, I could see him. We met eye to eye. And, uh, but he said, Coach, I like to, I've never been up north. I'd like to come up and see your place. So we flew him on up, and he stayed in school. And he was our quarterback of our 1992 national championship team. <coughs> and Delmaia was probably one of the most focused young men that I ever met. He, he was, you know, he just, he knew he had some limitations. But he overcome those limitations and, that he had from just being so focused on what he had to do. I, I'm looking out here and I saw that snow and it, it reminded me of the, the Maya. The Maya had always been in Florida, okay? Well, we're practicing now in November. We've made the playoffs and we're into, into November, just <coughs> December. And we have a practice and the snow is just about like it is now, maybe even a little heavier. And it, just, it, it started just like that. We're right in the middle of college. And he comes up, and, and he comes over the ball. He's a center. He's a quarterback. And he gets his hands down, and the snow starts. And he doesn't say anything. And we're all standing looking. He takes off his helmet, steps back, looks up, sticks his tongue out, tries to catch some snow. And I says, Demaya, would you like to tell me what's going on? And he says, Coach, I've never seen snow before. So all the other seniors, they all take off their, their helmets and everybody's looking up, get to the snow. And I said, damn. It wasn't, it wasn't the last guy I recruited from Florida, but a lot of them. Dave was a sophomore and going to be a good football player. He played a lot for us as a sophomore. Father, the athletic director. 
And Dave was out cutting grass at that time. It, it was one of the old lawnmowers now. They made it, it was a power lawnmower, but it had the old blades on it. And he hit a stump, and the, the blade broke off and went through the back of his foot, slicing off his Achilles tendon right into half of the bone at the Fort Wayne Hospital. And the doctor there, he says, I do not want my son's foot cut off. He says, we won't cut it off. So they, they, put a, they put a middle bar in it on the, the heel. They cut it up, and then they brought him back in a big cast. And he, was in my, he was in my class. Now, this was going to be his, his uh, this was going to be into, going into his Every day, his father put that leg into a whirlpool. Every day, his father massaged that foot pushed on it, you know, pushed the toes back, pushed the toes back, moved it. You know, he did he did physical therapy back then, what they are learning to do today. We're playing against Swan in the ball game up here. They were in our league. And he rushed for 362 yards that game. Now he carried the ball 42 times. He rushed 300 and he he still, I, I don't know if he still owns a record, right? but that year he rushed for over 14. He won the uh, Bronze Star in Vietnam and never said a word about what he did in Vietnam. He was a Marine. He said, well, I had a, uh, I had a squad. We were going through a rice paddy field and we were, we were, we were to get to a certain objective that afternoon and to see if there was any strays out there of Americans. He said, going through this rice paddy field and all of a sudden machine gun fire opened up on us. So we hit into the rice paddies and we were, he says, I was literally in rice paddies and water up to my nose. And none of us could move. One of us had got hit, but we couldn't go anywhere because they were up on like a little hill and that's where the machine gun was at. So Mel said, finally, what I did, I had had enough of it, I crawled around and he said crawled on my belly as far as I could, had to go underwater and muck and everything, but came around the other side of the hill where, where the VCs was at. And he said I looked up and I saw there were, there were four of them there and they had machine guns and they were firing us and they kept us down. And he said I reached <coughs> in and I thought I had, I did, on each, each side I had hand grenades. And he said, I reached for my hand grenades, and when I was th crawling through all that muck, he said, I lost them. He said, so all I had was my, I had a 45 and my knife, and he said, I used that and got rid of all four of the guns. And then raised the squad and came through. Now, how would you like to coach a young man like that? A guy who would talk about having your buddy's back, And he had, and that's the way he played football. He had his, he had his team's back. They'd always look at Mel Long and say, what do you think? He says, I think we can beat him today. If I could give you one word in here today, magic. You know, can you break that word down? Magic. Make a greater individual commitment. That's magic, isn't it? Make a greater individual commitment. So I ask my football players, if you make a greater individual commitment to our program, you know, good things are going to happen to all of us. Good things are going to happen to you. Good things are going to happen to me. Good things are going to happen to our university. It will be magic. But you have to make a greater individual commitment. And that's the word magic. But you, you make the big time where you are. The, the big time is not a place. The big time is not a place. It's all in the state of your mind. Okay? It's not something you get. It's something you become. 